<laughs> I'll play a little bit, and then if you have any any questions uh, at any time, that's usually the best workshops clinics are those the ones that have questions, so I know which in which direction to go. And I'm usually giving clinics for a bunch of drummers, so um, so this one's a little different than, than my average clinic, but. Um, but it's all the same stuff. It's music. It's all the same. So I'll, let me play a little bit and then we'll go from there. Is that cool? <laughs> Thank you. 
thing. I said, you know, it looks way different from this side than from this side from what I'm seeing. And there's actually, we did a project last year at the guitar professor, Southern Miss, where you have a uh, you can look for it on YouTube, but it's not where you would think it would be listed. I think of it, I'll send it to you, you can post it. But what it is, it's a recording of me playing um, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. I'm here at this stage. It's a recording of me with a GoPro camera on my head and speakers in my ears. I meant speakers, microphones. Microphone speakers. <laughs> microphones in my ears. So what's being recorded is exactly what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing. Stereo microphones. And it, it's really cool. When you look at it, I was, uh, when I watch it, I just go, wow, that's, and when I listen to that recording on a stereo, I said, that sounds right. Because, you know, drum set players, how many times do you listen to a recording and the hi-hat's on the wrong side? Mm -hmm. It's on the right, and the floor tom's on the left, and you go, that's not right. That's backwards. It's left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's from the audience perspective, right? So, you know, if you play drums, you're always used to hearing the hi-hat over here and the floor tom over here. So you listen to all these recordings and it's all backwards. So when you hear a recording where it's recorded from the drummer's perspective, it's like, I didn't realize how it would hit me. It hit me like I was really comfortable listening to this recording. It's like, oh yeah, that's the way it's supposed to sound. I'm hearing the right pitches in the right ear. And so anyway, that, and then, and then there's video of me and I didn't know, I, I really didn't know where I was looking because I'm playing melody and harmony at the same time. And I was curious to see from the project if I was looking at, if I was watching the melody or watching the harmony. And it's actually a little of both, so. That's got to be one of the most pleasant sounds of all the instruments out there. Can you tell us a little history of that? Sure. Um, this is an infant of an instrument. It's, the, it's one of the youngest acoustic chromatic instruments, or it is the youngest acoustic chromatic instrument that we know that we, that has uh, become popular, that's actually used. And uh, of course everyone thinks of this instrument as a Caribbean instrument, and it does come from the Caribbean, it comes from Trinidad, not Jamaica. Saying I get all the time, I go play gigs, they say, play those Jamaica drums. I was telling him, you write your request on a large denomination of U.S. currency and I'll you call them whatever you want. I will play that tune. But, but uh, they're not from Jamaica. In fact, there's more, there's more steel pans at the University of Southern Mississippi than there are in the whole country of Jamaica. Mm. Um, and they're not drums. It's, this is actually much more closely related to a vibraphone. In fact, this particular voice is the exact same range as a vibraphone, it's three octaves. But I go down to an E, if you're familiar with a vibraphone, the vibraphone's lowest note is the F. And I love having that E. I wish vibraphones had an E on them. You know, you, you know what I'm saying. Leading tone. <coughs> um, but this is, this instrument was invented in 1946. The first, the first um, steel pan we made out of 55 gallon oil barrels in 1946. You know your history, that's right at the end of World War II, right? So what, what was going on in Trinidad is a British, Trinidad was a, is a British colony. They had a lot of slaves, African and Indian slaves. Actually, Trinidad is made up 40% um, African Trinis and 40% Indian Trinis. India, 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 not Indians. There are Indian natives there too, as well. But um, so they got the food down there is killer. It's like, and we got they got the beans and rice going with the curry. It's like, mm. it's 
very similar to Cajun food, kind of, but different. Um, anyway, 1946, and what what happened was there was there used to be noise ordinances in, in Trinidad. The government would take the African and Indian take their instruments away and destroy them. And uh, so they just used what they, they could. And there's a lot of, there was a lot of gangs, a lot of, um, a lot of gangs throughout Trinidad, Port Spain. And uh, they used to parade, they used to just get together. Each gang had a yard. They actually had a place for the, for the gangs. And these gangs still exist today, but they're not, as we know them, gangs. They're musical ensembles, they're steel bands. They still have their yards. There's the renegades, desperados, invaders. They're still all there. You can you can tell the new groups that have come around because they have names like the Harmonites. <laughs> Nobody's going to name their gang the Harmonites. <laughs> all right. But uh, the, the gang names you can tell which ones are old, which ones are new. Um, Starlift. Yeah, it's not a good gang. <laughs> Uh, so in 1946, they were banging it up. The story goes, they, even before that, they were, allowed, they were allowed to parade and congregate one day out of the year. And guess what day that is? One day out of the year they were allowed, because they weren't allowed to congregate in large groups during the war, because they were afraid of being an easy target, you know, bombings and what, what have you. It was very strict. It was, it was an oppressed country at the time. And uh, but they were allowed to par parade and have fun one day out of the year. It's a lot of Catholics. Carnival groups. Carnival. Carnival Tuesday. Mardi Gras. Okay. You know what carnival means, by the way? It's, it's going to give you a whole new impression of the store shoe carnival. Carnival. Do you know where that comes from? It's a Catholic holiday. What is it? It's right before, right before Lent, Tuesday. Why right? we call it Carney Ball, Fat Tuesday. Carney, you know what Carney means? Meat. Carney, ba, vamos. Go to the meat. No, the meat goes. The meat goes. You gotta get rid of the meat. The meat goes. Carnival. Meat goes. You gotta get rid of the meat because you gotta fast for 40 days. Can't eat meat for 40 days. So Carnival. So that's where it comes from. So now, shoe carnival. Shoe meat goes. <laughs> Make a lot of sense. But carnival is Mardi Gras. And wherever you have a large group of Catholics, you have carnival. So um, they were allowed to parade during carnival. And they'd have parades, and there was, they would go around beating on whatever they could find, which is biscuit tins, paint cans, bamboo. They had groups called Bamboo Tambu. You've heard of the boo bands where you hit them in their different pitches? So they did the same thing. You got different length, size uh, pieces of bamboo and bang them on the ground. And they create bass lines with this. Like split, like, you know, you've seen bass drummers in the march band, split, split bass lines and they do this. And they parade and then have metal sounds. A lot of metal sounds. And oil is uh, Trinidad's number one export. So lots of drilling over there. They have a Navy, uh, a U.S. Naval station there, still do, um, and they had a lot of oil cans. So the Trinities figured out that you could bend metal from beating on it. And they realized after beating on a paint can or a biscuit tin that they they get these little dents in the can and it would create different sounds, different timbre, different pitches. This, took, this was totally by accident, but that's what they got. And then this guy, Ellie Minette, said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make a steel drum out of a 55-gallon oil barrel, and I'll have, I can, I can have like a whole octave, which is ridiculous. You know, before it was just like two or three notes. And uh, so he created the first one out of a 55-gallon oil barrel, 1946 and played it for Carnival, and that was the introduction to the steel pan to the world. And it's fairly primitive at the time. Since then, he's invented seven, there's nine voices in the steel pan orchestra. These are called double seconds. This is the alto voice. If you've seen somebody playing on one pan, 
That's the lead pan. It's called a tenor pan, to be just to confuse you, because it was the first one. And they could play a middle C on the tenor pan. They said, wow, that's really low compared to all the little cans that they had they were playing. That was really low. So they called it a tenor pan. Well, as they developed, of course, it became a soprano pan, but King kept the name tenor pan. So it's called tenor pan or lead pan. You know. um, and then this is like the alto voice. They also have something called double tenors. This, this instrument's set up in whole tones. Okay, so I got two whole tones, right? How many whole tone scales are there? Two. Right, so between the two whole tones, I have a chromatic instrument. Three octaves. Okay? And it's kind of going back and forth. There is a pattern. You just got to learn what it is. Everybody asks me, how do you learn? Just get behind them and start hitting notes. <laughs> Figure out where they are. And every, so every voice is different. Just because I can play double seconds doesn't mean I can play the other voices. It's like a totally different instrument. The notes are in a different place. The lead pan that they're in a circle of fifths are fourths. Depend if you're Republican or Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> right? What if you're independent? Yeah. There's something called a spider web pen. I mean, uh, 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 not spider. That is a spider web pen. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Invader pen. Right. Where they're just all over the place. Right. And notes are just random. It's like I look at it and go, what? It's crazy. So, how are they actually tuned if like, someone's making Good question. It? Okay, so they're tuned with a hammer. Um, this. I'm going to carry this with me because every now and then you have to tune it yourself. I have to tune it myself. Like when I'm flying or something, I get and I, somebody banged it and a couple of notes go out of tune and I have to get them. I'm not very good at it. This is, that's an art. You know, tuning these pans is really an art. And, uh, but I can get it. You know, I've gone to a couple workshops so I can learn how to do it just enough to get, get them back in tune. But I can't get them the same. That's a C sharp. If I if I were to tune it, it'd probably sound something like this. I might I get the right pitch, but I won't get all the overtones. You, know, you have to really know what you're doing to get all the overtones so it rings and it resonates. Is it does it happen sometimes where you tune one note and it affects? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it can pull the metal. Yeah. I mean, you just think of this thing. Look at each note. This is just a you know metal with a certain tension on the metal. It's just a metal face, each note. And there's a certain tension on each one. So you gotta figure out how to make that tension tight or loose, right? So obviously, if I want this note to go flat, if I get it sharp, the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna smack it right in the middle. A lot harder than that with this hammer. Where it bends the metal and it loosens the metal and it'll go flat. If I want it to go sharp, I go from underneath and smack it in the middle, automatically tighten it. And that's how I get this on the middle. Now to get all the harmonics, you gotta, you gotta hit it out on the side, you gotta pull it. It's almost like having a facelift. You gotta pull the metal sideways to get all the harmonics all lined up. And you just tune it like that. And, and it takes a lot. And you see, you see there's lines, they got these lines between it, those are hinges. That's so, they put those there so that it won't interfere too much with the note next to it. So you can, once you put those lines in there, you can a little more easily uh, tune in individual notes. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to play some stuff. My, my boat speaker, I can't believe the battery's dead. I must have left it on. Um, yes, sir. You have some a play? I can play. Yeah. So, you want to plug your phone? Yeah. yeah we'll some Are y'all familiar with um, <coughs> maybe steel band, steel pan orchestras? Have you ever heard one? We have a 40 piece steel pan orchestra at Southern Mass. Oh. And, and in Trinidad, that's considered a very small band. That's a small band. In fact, the small bands. The small band competition is, I believe, 65 and smaller. And then the medium bands are like 85 and smaller. And then the large bands are 120. Wow. 
and then 20 players. Hope they don't all play at the same time. All at the same time. Oh, and I've yeah. gone down there, and let me tell you something. <coughs> you might want to put that on your bucket list. Huh. Just to go to Trinidad during Carnival yeah. and experience Panorama. Panorama competition is always a Saturday before Fat Tuesday. Mm -hmm. uh, You could, I mean, you can definitely look this up online and see lots of videos. I've gone down and played in Panorama uh, a few times, and it's it's a blast. Um, but here, let me just real quick so you can kind of. Yeah, how long, how long do I have, Ricky? You can go as long as you like, and that's supposed to be an hour. Okay. So let me let me real quick. This is uh this is the steel cap.
group was that? S S Amispo. S S Great uh, great arrangement. Yeah, that's Andy Norell's uh, We Kind of Music. Which, by the way, he just put out a new album. If you don't know what Andy Norell is, he's probably the most recorded pan player in the world. He just put out a new album. Uh, we Kind of Music came out literally last week, and the drummer on the album is is Vic Vic. Uh, McMurchie. He was a student of mine. Actually, he's the drummer on this recording. But he went to Paris. Actually, Andy came to Southern Miss, heard him play, and go, who is this Who is this guy? And he called him up, and he's playing on his new album, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So, and, then, and this tune is on that album. And he wrote this for Panorama, and it's the first time at Panorama anyone ever played 6-8. And they got last place <laughs> <laughs> because they played six. Right. So the other rhythm is soca. Also now known as reggaeton. Right? A little fast version. Despacito. But that's, you know, those are the, the typical rhythms you find in Calypso from Trinidad. And the soca is really an introduction of American music into Calypso. So it's a combination of disco and Calypso. So, and that's what reggaeton is as well. It's a combination of reggae and disco. Now they got the... Oh no. I know. <laughs> kind of well, what is the... Um... The reason behind this, a lot of the instruments are metallic. What is that about? Just to cut, to cut. When you have 120 people in the band, uh -huh. you got all that. Right. Let me tell you, it's some kind of loud too. The yeah. first year I went, I went down with Robbie Greenwich and played in his band. And y'all know who Robbie Greenwich is? Great jazz pan player. Probably one of the best jazz pan players I've ever heard. And I don't believe who he plays for them. That's Jimmy Buffett's hand player. <laughs> <laughs> Making the catch, Jimmy Buffett. He's also, uh, he played, he's the pan player on uh, the Bill Withers. You're the, uh, the, you know the... Y'all know that, right? Just the two of us. Yes, and there's the original, the, the not the radio version, original on Grover Washington's album. Steel, and there's a great steel pan solo in the middle. That's Robbie Grant. Anyway, I went down there with him and Ralph McDonald. You know who Ralph McDonald is? Percussion. Yeah, one of the most recorded percussionists ever. Really, God, he played with everybody in the '70s and '80s. Everybody. You anyway, know, he just he passed away about oh about six seven years ago. Went down there with them, played in their big band, and uh, was, I forgot I forgot what the original story was. Actually. What were we talking about? <laughs> oh, yeah, why they're so loud? That's right. Thank you. That's exactly right. And Robbie put me right next to the engine room, so I'm playing, and I'm right next to. They had five people playing break drums. These guys are all deaf. Yeah. You know, these old guys just. <laughs> And it's so freaking loud. I said, oh my God. I went to him, I said, dude, I can't even hear myself think, much less hear myself play. You gotta move me. <laughs> so he moved me somewhere else. I said, you need to put some young person over there. <laughs> Too old for that. So anyway, it's loud. It's really loud. The engine room's really loud. It's a lot of loud. So any and a lot of cowbells too. People playing cowbells. Keep that. That's, uh, that's Panorama. It's really cool. You should check it out sometime. I'm, I, I want to go to different carnivals around the world. I, uh, you know, I've been to Rio de Janeiro, which is crazy, awesome, dangerous, all that stuff. Go with someone you know, you know so, someone that knows their way around. Uh, and then Trinidad is really um, amazing. I, mean, you, you, I can't describe it. Can't describe. It. You just have to go and just listen to these steel bands in the open. 
It's like, it'll change your life. I swear. I don't care if you're percussionist. It doesn't matter. You know, to watch the crowd, the, the whole crowd pulses like this. Like when the band's playing, just chuk, 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 the whole crowd's just doing this. Just like, it's like so cool. And I want to go to Uruguay too for the candombe drumming, carnival. That's, an, that's another. I haven't been to that one. I want to go to that one. You talk about playing Cuban percussion and some of the different like, combinations and things that you use. Um, yeah, we can talk about that a little bit. The, the Cuban percussion. We don't have a lot of time, right? How much time do we have left? We have about um, 20, 30 minutes. Okay. Um, well, the Cumbas aren't here. Uh, the Cuban percussion, I mean, that's a whole different thing. I'll say this, if you're a percussionist, actually if you're a musician, know the origin of all these styles. And it's so easy to do now, the internet and stuff, but know the origin of all the rhythms and know where they came from. Like so many people mix up samba and salsa. And it's from two different worlds. It's a train wreck. It's a train wreck. It happens, I mean, right? Yeah. It happens all the time. And you, the, what, one of the most frustrating things is as a drummer, you get a chart and it says Latin. <laughs> <laughs> Latin? Oh my God. It's like saying American or European. What style is this? Oh, it's European. <laughs> Be a little more vague. <laughs> you know, the thing is, Latin, usually it's impossible. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. But know the difference. Know where they all came from, and then if you want to morph things and put them together after knowing what they are, that's cool. But know what it is first. It's got to, you got to know how to draw within the lines before you draw outside the lines. Isn't that a Charlie Parker quote or something? Or learn your theory so you can forget it. Same kind of thing. All right. Um, now, I know you're all musicians and everything, and I got to tell you, my upbringing was a typical uh, college uh, experience uh, for percussionists, classical trained percussionists, where I'd go uh, to my lessons and I'd be given some repertoire and told to go learn it and come back the next week and play it. And we talked a lot about technique and that sort of thing. And I didn't, I didn't learn much about music. I didn't know it at the time, but I wasn't learning much about music. Um, I, think, I think two of the, I tell my students, two of the most important courses you need to take in college, whether they're on, they're pro and they're probably not on your degree plan, but one of them is improv, and the other one is a business class. If you want to work, if you want a career in music, you need to know, and I don't even call it improv, I call it functional theory. Just functional theory. It's not jazz. No, I don't, I don't play jazz. It's not jazz. It's just functional theory. Whereas the other class they go to, I call that dysfunctional theory. If you don't have your instrument in your hand when you're learning about theory, it's dysfunctional. If you don't actually know how to use it on your instrument, it's dysfunctional. If, it's not, if you don't have it to the point of application, it's dysfunctional. So you have to be able to apply what you, what you know, or it's worthless. And I had I have a lot of worthless information. I got a master's from North Texas, and it, but it's in classical. And I had a lot of useless information in my head until I went to University of Iowa, where I took from Tom Davis, who was a great jazz vibraphonist. And he kind of released all this information and taught me how to use it. Did I really? think of myself as a functional musician. I was a drummer. I could play drums. I played a lot of drum set and stuff. But as a vibraphonist, a melodic player, I didn't really think of myself as functional until he showed me, you know, how to how to how to read a lychee. You know? So make sure you're doing that. I think everybody here is are we all jazz studies makers? No? Yes? Yeah. Who's not a jazz player? Okay, so, so I don't need to be telling you that. All right, so you have that in your curriculum. But uh, I think that should be required of all music majors, personally. 
You have to take your crop. And a business course. You may not take that, but take a, take a business. You better know how to write a contract, read a contract, you know, or you're going to get burned. You will get burned. I, I had to learn the hard way. So, doing a lot of gigs and stuff. So taxes, all that stuff. That's the stuff they don't teach you in college, you know. Try to find that out. All right. Um, so, as far as the Cuban percussion stuff, I don't, you know, we could do a whole master class on just that. But I would say definitely learn the Congo patterns and what they're for, and Bongo, and, uh, and the bell patterns and everything. There's a great book, Ed Uribe's Essential uh, Afro-Cuban, what's it called? Essential Studies for Afro-Cuban Drumming. That's by Ed Uribe. It's an excellent book. The first half of the book talks about the original instruments. Um, all the line, and then the second half of the book teaches you how to take all that and apply it on your own set. He was at Berkeley, but he passed, he passed away just a few years ago, very young. All right, so let me show you this other thing I do. This is actually my specialty. I go, um, I get to travel a lot doing this stuff. And uh, so if you go to, and, and that's the rudiments, and I'll say this about rudimental drumming and music, the, it's the same concept, and that's the fundamentals. Make sure you have your fundamentals down so you can take them somewhere, all right? But with scales, arpeggios, actually I say, learn your arpeggios. Scales aren't important. Especially bum da ba da ba da ba dum da You ever hear that in a tune? <laughs> Has anybody ever heard that in a tune? I've never heard that in a tune. So but we practice that all the time. Dum da ba da ba dum. No, but arpeggios, I'm cranking my drum up right now. This is just put the tension on the head. And uh Scale, the arpeggios, if you, if, you know what the, if you know what the chord tones are, you're fine. How you get, a scale is just a way to get from one chord tone to another. That's where I had it. It's a, a bridge to get from one chord tone to another. Um, all right, so, any questions thus far? All right, this is this is kind of a kind of a bizarre thing to go to, I guess. But this is this is rudimental drumming, and for drummers, you know, we have our rudiments, and they came from this from military drumming, and you know, military drumming was um, they used to they have all these calls, you know, they use the drummers told everyone what to do. It was the cell phone of the day. Right? This is the old iPhone iPhone 0.06 or whatever. This is the iPhone. This is how they told them to charge, retreat, wake up, go to bed, meal time was was with this. Alright. So it's a big drum. It's 17 inches by 17 inches. And it it hangs to the side so they could walk. And this is where this grip came from, which a lot of jazz drummers prefer this left-handed grip. It came from here because to play match grip on this drum, you have to jack your elbow up like this, and after you're playing on this all day, this would get very tiresome. Okay, so they came up with this underhand grip to relax the elbow. And that's where this comes from. So that's why that's why drummers hold their stick this way. Alright? So I'm gonna play I'm gonna play an ancient snare drum solo. It's called uh, Crazy Army. And if you ever listen to Steve Gadd, you may have heard him play this. What tune did he play that on? Play it on a couple tunes. I think, uh, oh, uh, Legend of the one I Sailor. Is that Chuck Mangione tune? Anyway, you can look him up, and he plays it on drum set. Very, very funky. So this is uh, Crazy Army. It's going to be loud if you want to cover your ears. That's quite all right. Um, and it uses a lot of the rudiments. So a lot of the basics that we, I mean, you, you learn how to play a seven-stroke roll, flam a cue, flam taps, flam paradiddles, they're all in this solo. 
So let me do that. <coughs> between the two. So this is great technique to use on the drum set. If you ever listen to drummers like Ricky, or you ever listen to David Garibaldi, you know what that is? Tower Power, Vinny Kaliuta, who was just here last weekend, right? I heard him. You ever listen to these guys? And you can tell when you listen to them that they have great rudimental technique because they have really good control of all the stuff down low, but they got that power on top as well, and they got a lot of contrast. But you know, you listen to some drummers, it's real monodynamic. It's not a lot of highs and lows within a phrase. I'm not talking about just getting soft or playing loud. I'm talking about doing both at the same time. That comes from doing this stuff. All right, so um, I have, I've written a couple books on the subject. And if you're interested, I, I got them both here. This is uh, this is actually the appendices to my dissertation, and it's called the Drummer's Rudimental Reference Book, and uh, it's quite popular at universities around the, around the world, actually. So, and it's got a lot of information. It's just a lot of exercises on rudimental drumming, and it'll keep keep you busy for the rest of your life. So, so. <laughs> me too. Yes. What are the origins of those rhythms? Okay. What's that? What are the origins of the rudimental rhythms? That's a good question. Okay. Most, of the most of the rudiments are come from Switzerland. Um, and then the others are European. And then there's one rudiment actually that I was playing is has an American origin, and that's the flamicue. And the flamicue is the funkiest rudiment. It's the only rudiment where the accent's not on the downbeat. It's this one. That's the only American root. The rest of them, these are called Swiss Army triplets. Flam tabs, Swiss Army triplets, flam, single flam windmill, single paradiddles, double paradiddles, triple paradiddles, paradiddle diddles. Flam paradiddle diddles. Flam paradiddles. Fake flam paradiddles. Uh, huh? That's right. That's right. You can't. You can't. All about this. Yeah. Um. John, would you say that uh, how many of the rudiments that would you say? Have an equivalent on hand drums like Congress would think. Actually, I think 
the rudiments themselves, not so much. The technique that we use to work on the rudiments can be applied all over the place. Um, but I mean, like on congas, they play a lot of flams. Uh, yeah, they play flams. Actually, I know conga players, they work on their rolls mm -hmm. with the, you know, heel toes. Yeah. Actually, Giovanni Hidalgo and I played together one time in Puerto Rico. We did rudimental stuff. Yeah. And he was play we were playing well, open rolls and stuff. Y'all yeah. <laughs> know who that is? Hang on one second, I gotta find a recording. I'm gonna play something for you. Um, this this other book I have real quick is has a lot of play along tracks. And let me just do one of those. So the whole book actually eat every exercise, there's 25 sections, it's all about rudimental technique. Every every exercise has a play along track, and every play along track is in seven different tempos. From tempo del Lerno to ludicrous speed. <laughs> Space ball. Um, so hang on. Let me play one of those. Just so you can hear it. Let's see, let's think of a good one here. Think of a funky one, one you might like. <laughs> This is this is working on rolls. Six stroke rolls, six stroke rolls, nine stroke rolls, ten stroke rolls, and eleven stroke rolls. So if you want to work on your rolls, roll quality, we're talking about double stroke rolls. These, okay? Just so you know, this thing we work on five stroke rolls. Seven, six, nine, ten, eleven, thirteen, fifteen, seventeen. So those are that's how many notes I played. Seventeen notes. <laughs> Did you count them? <coughs> All right. So this is the etude. I don't, you know. If y'all are in, if, if if you have any, like I said, if you have anything you're interested in, please ask. If there's something you're not interested in, say, look, skip it. Let's go to something else. Um, <laughs> But this is the A2 for lesson nine. And each lesson has several exercises that start out fairly basic, get more complicated. And this is an A2, the culminating A2 that puts everything together. So we'll play this at tempo five. So just so you get an idea of what this is about. In case you have some drum students in the, in the future, all the right stuff but it's kind of like playing a game you play so there's recordings you know what that is it's a metronome you're playing to a metronome a very hip metronome but that's all it is it's just a metronome now there's also as you go through it there's different there's different styles in other words that, that, like a six stroke roll, for example, I can play it like this, or I can play it like this. It's 
same sticking, but it's a different interpretation. So I would say this is more of a funky you know, six tuplet interpretation and more of a classical, maybe rigid interpretation. But this that happens throughout the book. And so it's that's in the metronome. So they hear these things. And without without knowing it, each section is in a different style of music. This this section is hip hop music. The one before it, it goes it's uh it's gamelan from from Bali, Thailand. Can you play another track? Huh? Can you play another track? Yeah. For other of it, another another style. Another yeah. style. Let's do uh, we'll go to my we'll go to uh, how about how about steel pans? <laughs> this is the flam taps of a single flam mill. This is lesson thirteen. So we're gonna flam taps in the single flam mill, which is similar to a flam tap. Couple of extra notes. And uh, you want to do the etude? I'll do the etude, I guess. Um, let's see, lesson 13. And so the backing tracks to all this is steel band music. And each one's different. So I got, you know, Afro Cuban, uh, Tango from Argentina, some Piazzolla in there, all kinds of cool stuff. And then, uh, American music, you know, jazz. Uh, and, and this is, like I said, this is the tempos one through seven. Uh, let me do it in a small tempo. I'm going to do this in twice so you can kind of see the difference. Here's tempo two. This might be boring. It's not entertaining. Yeah. It's not entertaining because it's so slow, but this is hard. The slow tempos are the hardest. something else up there. This is totally, this is like a circus kind of thing. It's relevant. Some people say maybe not. But okay, so we do a lot of stick tricks, stick visuals, you know, in the drum line. You know, stick flips as you're seeing, twirls, tosses. We do a lot of that kind of stuff. And uh, so I, I proposed a few years ago that we do a clinic, since everybody's doing this, and it's, and it's really, 
there's these, there's a lot of people on YouTube that are like drummers flock to these videos. You know what I'm talking about? The Bi BYOS guys, and Jeff Queen. So um, I, I did a clinic called the Stick Visuals, but I put a group together called the Flam Five, and it's actually those two guys: Ralph Nader, Harvey Thompson, Jeff Queen, uh, Jeff Prosper, and myself. And we wrote a piece. Uh, we each wrote a section of a piece and we put all these stick tricks together and we did a clinic at the Percussive Arts Convention on all the different stick tricks. And it was hugely popular. <coughs> so we had to do it again the next year. But we, we had some we had people that couldn't do it, so Scott Johnson of the Blue Devils uh, played with us. And, uh, and we did it, we've done it the last four years. We're doing it again in a couple weeks at the, in Indianapolis. But anyway, I'll, I'm going to play a little bit of it, and it's five of us playing together. So this is all very precise, you know, the rudimental drumming, you know, it's very precise. Everything's got to be exactly right, clean with the guy next to you. And, but we also did all these crazy stick visions. And we each wrote a section, and we had to learn, and then we taught the other guys how to play. Um, which for me was... It was, I knew it would be tough. It'd be a learning experience for me because, he, like Ralph Nader's half my age, he does some ridiculous things. And it's a little bit of a circus act. But it's also using the rudiments. It's a combination of um, technique, music, and craziness. And uh, anyway, I did a lot of cussing and uh, a lot of a lot of sticks on the ground. Uh, a, lot, a lot of swearing when I was practicing, but, um, but we put it together and it's, it's been a lot of fun. So let me see if I can find this track. We do it to a, a, a track. Because so. snare drums, it is, we are playing with one pitch. Okay. We're limited. I hear you, and I, yeah, these are these are big sticks. It's, it's because that's a big drum. <coughs> this is my signature stick, actually, and this is actually lead on the back. It's lead. It makes it makes a stick heavier, but it gives the illusion that it's lighter. Is that damp the vibration? No, it just makes the front end feel lighter because it you have know, lead in the back, so it changes the balance point. <laughs> And as I do like these individual things, we're playing a lot of really fast stuff, and it just gives me a little edge. And I'm 55 now, so I need that. I need every little. <laughs> you don't need more. Uh, yeah.
So, yeah, it's a little crazy, but yeah. This is super relevant. Um, so, did you ever march in DCI? Yes. Where? It's very relevant. Okay. It's yeah, very so relevant. that's what I meant. No, um, that, I mean, that's where I got my background. Actually, my teacher was Marty Hurley. I don't know who Marty Hurley is or was. Yeah. He taught right down the road at Brother Marty for 30 some odd, 35 years. Ago. He was my teacher. But, um, I'm from Lafayette. So, I, you know, I grew up in Louisiana and I went to Southeastern Louisiana, Hammond, my freshman year. And back then, Southeastern had probably the best jazz program in the state. Uh, other than maybe Loyola at the time. At the time, it was a really great jazz program with Ron Nethercutt. And so I went there my freshman year, and he, I, I had some drum corps experience. I marched with a small drumming field corps out of Indiana, and I wanted to continue you know, that study. And he goes, I got the guy you need to study with. And he brought me to a lesson uh, with Marty, Marty Hurley, my brother Martin. And I, rem I remember the first lesson because we worked on flam paradiddles. He played flam paradiddles, and I was like, I was just going, because <laughs> mine sounded like this. And he told me, he goes, if you can't come back here in two weeks and play flam paradiddles without any flat flams, that's the, the pop sound. Don't bother coming to another lesson. <laughs> and I went, dude, serious, <laughs> serious. So that was the beginning of my relationship with Marty Hurley. Of course, my flat parents got better. I went back to the lesson, and um, he had he invited me to go march with the Phantom Regiment. So I'm, and I marched in the Phantom Regiment in Salem for four years. And then uh, after I aged out, I went to North Texas, did my master's degree when I was down there. I went back and taught the Phantom Regiment for five years. Oh. I wrote, I used to write their shows. And stuff. So late 80s, if you ever hear anything from the late 80s, Phantom Regiment, that was my stuff. Cool. <laughs> um, and then of course, Marty and I became very, very good friends and business partners. And uh, he was considered part of my family. And then of course he had his uh, stroke about seven years ago now. Too young, too young. He was a marathon runner, and so you never know. Um, but that was my that was my drum corps experience, and with him, um, I, I you know I'm where I am today, in a large part because of, because of what he taught, and it wasn't just rudimental drum. It's life lessons, but it was, it was that what you do, your technique you use, must be transferable. It's not just you know, a lot of band directors teach techniques out there that are shortcuts, so they can win that trophy. You know, we're very trophy driven, and there's a lot of shortcuts being taught, and it's not good education. It's not good music education in a lot of schools. And a lot of you may have come from a program that's like that, where you work on eight minutes of music during marching band season, and about 15 music, minutes of music during concert band season. If you even have a concert band anymore, now they have indoor drum line, they just march, snare drum year round. And uh, it's, 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 that's, to me, that's not, a, it's no good. It's not learning your theory. It's not you learning functional music. Any other questions? When do you use a match grip? I, I use it time to time. It's not uh, on the drum set. Sometimes on the drum set. Depends on what kind of music I'm playing. If I'm playing, you know, I've played in rock bands. Or, blues band where I'm having to play loud back beats and stuff and my hand gets tired playing traditional grip, I might switch to match grip. But I prefer to play the traditional grip. I mean, I just grew up playing that way. Yeah. Even in orchestra, when I play in orchestras, I play traditional grip. They, some people call this an orchestral grip and this a rudimental grip. That's, that's just, so they just associate this with orchestral playing and they associate this with rudimental playing. But some great orchestral players play Traditional <coughs> and some great rudimental players play match grip, so it's you know. Physiologically, it's match grip is more natural. It is. I mean, you, if you go to a kid and you tell them to pick up sticks, thing. they're going to pick them up like this. Yeah. 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 But I learned. I started this way. I, I can. I can do stuff 
my left hand that I can't I can't do this right. Well, it's because you have worked hard. Enough. That's right. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I need to I need to work hard. I need to work you hard. Say that. <laughs> it's true. No, I I do work on my match grip quite a bit, but I still prefer the cartridge. The buddy Rich did too. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. He's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how do you uh, how do you do your single stroke like buddy with the left hand? You mean traditional grip or match? No, just like that. When he comes over and does this. Just with the left hand. Huh? Just with the left hand. Yeah, how did he? Kind of yeah. like oh, oh, he did this. He did yeah. the Joe, yeah, Joe Joe Mayer thing. I don't, I can't do that. <laughs> That's like a technique I'd have to work on. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna. And it's, actually, that's hard to do on a pad because the yeah. rubber sticks. It's got to slide. Well, just probably nice to watch Buddy do that kind of stuff. Wow. Oh. All right. Um, any other questions? A steel pan? A tune on steel pan? Sure. 